You are listening to the Pro Audio Series, presented by Life Vantage, featuring Trent Lindstrom. This audio presentation includes income and lifestyle claims, including, but not limited to, income earned, potential income of distributors, purchases made from income, such as homes, cars, vacations, etc. A complete earnings claim statement, which includes a summary of income earned by the distributors, can be found at lifevantage.com. If you look at this picture, and I show this picture for a reason, if you look at the picture here, you're going to see a dog. Uh, he's a Belgian Malinois. They look like a German Shepherd, but the difference between a Belgian Malinois and a German Shepherd is uh, a Belgian Malinois is like a German Shepherd on speed. I don't know how else to say it. They're high drive, high energy dogs. They're also very muscular dogs. They're really, really strong muscular dogs, and their jaw lines, jaw lines are, are very muscular, so they have a very solid bite. The way that these dogs work, they're not trained to bite. They're trained to apprehend. There's a big difference. Bite means just bite, 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 bite. What these dogs have been trained to do is to bite, to apprehend, and hold. So that means when they go to bite, they're biting for bone. Once they get their jaws locked into a bone, we literally have to choke the dog off the bite. Because their drives are so high that we can't just say, hey, all right, dog, you've done it, your job, get, get rid of it. The dog's drives are just through the roof at that moment, okay? So we literally pull up on a choke chain right up into their, uh, into their uh, air area, you know, their, into, their, into their neck, and we, we get them to where they can't breathe anymore. And so what do they do? They, they gag. They open their mouth up and gag. And they let go of the bite. That's how we do it. Now, if a dog does not get bone, they get like muscle or flesh, they'll reattach till they get bone. Now, I'm not telling you that because any of you guys might be a potential suspect, and if a dog's ever coming at you, you know what you should do. I'm telling you that because these dogs are high, high drive dogs. That actually, you see how his ears are up? I know what direction my dog is looking and focused because of his ears. So if his ears rotate and turn, that's where I know my dog's attention and focus is. If you look at this, I've actually got my left hand around the dog. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I got my left hand around him. Not because I'm petting him. It's because I'm physically holding him. He's a very strong postured dog. And the only reason why he's got that posture is because we had a guy standing behind the, the guy taking the camera, the, the photographer. We had a guy in a bite suit. And as soon as he stepped into view of the dog, the dog's behavior completely changed. Completely changed. And you're seeing that. Look where his ears are. He's just right out of the view of the camera. I mean, he's not staring at the camera. He's staring over here. He's staring at a bite suit. His ears are up. His focus is there. He's tense and ready to go. If I gave him a command, a small little command, he'd be in full flight for that uh, individual. Chances are, once he goes into flight, he probably isn't going to stop. He's going to go and finish exactly what his drive is. Okay? Now, I share this with you because if you're going to make this business work, and I'm going to be very real, you have got to want it like that dog wants it. There has to be a behavior change in you. Literally, a behavior change. You have to go to bed thinking about it. You have to wake up thinking about it. You have to get, quite frankly, crazy. And it's not just crazy about life vantage. It's crazy about getting something different in your life. Whatever it is, it does, I don't know. Everyone's different. We all have our own stories. Whatever it is for you, you've got to want it so bad that that change is so real that you can taste it. So bad that when you go to take that little bit of a snibble of what that life can be like, you hang on. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you connect with what, what I'm talking to you about? That's the kind of desire that has to be there for this business to work for you. If you kind of want it, it won't work. If you kind of want it, it will not work. It has to be something you put a lot of effort into. And the sacrifice part, there will be a sacrifice. And if whatever the rules are for the universe, I don't know how it works, but the law of, 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 of sacrifice in the universe says whatever you want the most of, you'll probably have to sacrifice on the front end. Because you have to appreciate what you get. If you need money, there'll probably be some kind of a sacrifice for money. So that's the kind of desire and commitment you have to make. Your posture will have to be different. And that is a big, big deal. I found people get involved in the business. They kind of wanted it. In fact, they were hungry for it at the beginning. But all it took was, boo, and they stopped. They weren't going to go build the business anymore. So I want to be very real what it's going to take for you to be successful in the business. Now, I don't believe you have to give everything away. Not everything. But there will be some things. In fact, some things that you don't want to have to put aside, you'll have to make that decision. It will be some family time commitments. My wife talked a little bit about that. For me to be successful in this business, I had to want it so bad that I had to step away for things that I wanted to be a part of. 
But I made the conscious decision that when I was going to do it, I was not going to slow play this thing. I wanted to make sure I got it as quick as I possibly could. I put everything I had into it, just like that dog in that posture you see there. Okay? So there is going to be a philosophy change that's absolutely necessary. For things to change, you have to change. I love that philosophy. That's a philosophy. A lot of times we want circumstances around us to change. Man, if only we weren't separated by water to all the things that are occurring, then I can make this work. Right? I, I, mine was I didn't have time. I didn't have time to actually build a business. How was I going to make this thing work? You've got to remove those obstacles. The ex obstacles can't be an excuse. They have to be a reason. For things to change, we have to make those changes. Don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Personal development. This is going to make you better. Right? Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Can we develop better skills? Yes, we can. That's what this personal development is about. We all have to make that conscious decision that we are going to make ourselves better. That we're going to look at those problems and say we're going to be solution-oriented and we'll develop whatever skill is necessary for us to get it. Don't wish for less challenges. Wish for more wisdom. Oh, I love that one. That's a good one. Formal education will help you make a living. Self-education will help you build a fortune. Here's some philosophy ideas. Life accumulates. You will either accumulate value or you will accumulate debt. The human brain, by natural instinct, will think 70% negative. That's a natural human uh, response. So when you think about the fear of making an invite or calling somebody on the phone or the fear of getting outside of your comfort zone, that's natural and normal and okay. As long as we've made the decision that we're willing to face it, that we're willing to step outside of it. Okay? That's what this is talking about. If we're willing to take that challenge and step outside of it, you're going to find you start to, to, to accumulate value. Have you heard that old saying, I, I, uh, you become the sum of the five people you spend most of your time with? That's where this falls into. If we allow those things to hold us back, we'll start to validate why it's not working for me to the people that's not working for them. And it becomes a negative momentum thing for you. You're putting up the excuses to why it doesn't work for me. And now you're accumulating the debt that's going to hold you down. And it's not just life damage. It's anything in your life. I don't care what it is. It does not matter. It's anything. It could be relationships. It could be jobs. It could be marriages. It could be family. I don't care what it is. Those things are going to hold you down. It's not what happens. It determines your life future. It's what you do that changes your life. You guys have heard, uh, heard of the, uh, the sailboat theory by uh, Jim Rohn? You guys are all going to have different types of winds blow against your personal sailboat. It'll put you in a direction you don't want to go. If you want to make that change, the change is available to you, and all it is is having all those winds blow you in a direction you don't want to go and just make a small adjustment to your personal cell. That small adjustment to your personal cell will push that boat completely into a different direction. That's what we're talking about with personal development, making our mind right when we're building our network marketing business. Are you willing to do what others won't to enjoy what others can't? This is the sacrifice element that we're talking about. You are going to have to be crazy. Steve Jobs talked about, you know, how are you successful as an entrepreneur? You have to be crazy about what you do. You have to be so passionate. You want to do it every single day. You've got to find that string in you. And it's the difference between operating on, man, I should have made a phone call today, or I should have done this, or I should have done that, to where it's a must. I must do it. You've got to find where that is deep inside of you. I don't know where it's at. With that dog that was up there, Robbie, we had to train him to recognize the desire to get that bite. And we built that up in that dog. We trained him weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months. But when we got it, the dog tasted it. And all it was was tasting it once. And that dog's drive was there. It was instinct. It was natural. You have to find that. So here's what I say. You could be frustrated and upset. And that might be get you to a spot that will make you change. You might be flat out ticked off and mad. That's okay. You might be inspired and motivated. That's good. I don't care. Emotion is emotion. Whether you're ticked off and mad or you're inspired and motivated, either way, it's an emotion that hopefully will drive an activity. You've got to find that spot. We have different systems that are in place. I'm going to kind of, I will cover these a little bit later. I'm going to kind of cut through this. All right, commitment. This is a big one. I find that a lot of people are committed on the front side when they connect to that emotion, but they allow the emotion to fall apart and then they lose that commitment. Okay, so you've got to be willing to follow a behavior or a system and be committed to that process. 
In my, with my son, he does motocross. And these are some outdated pictures, but this was a big jump that he had a lot of fear going over. He would not do it. And in motorcycles, if you come into the jump and you don't throttle into that jump, you're going to pitch the nose of your bike like this as you're going over the jump. The bad thing is, is on the other side of the jump, there is a landing spot. If you come up short or you put your front of your tire towards that, the crash is bad. It's not a pleasant experience. So we have a rule in motorcycles. When in doubt, throttle out. This is the same philosophy that applies to network marketing. If you're ever doubting, it's when you have to work harder. You've got to find that spot. You've got to be committed to getting to that core thing that's going to drive you. And when you find that, give it everything you have. Because that's what's going to get you over that jump. That's the commitment part of this business. Here's a philosophy by Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Accurate analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure disclosed the, lack, the fact that lack of decision was near the head of the list of 30 major causes of failure. There is no mere statement of theory. This is a fact. Analysis of several hundred people who had accumulated fortunes well beyond the million dollar mark disclosed the fact that every one of them had the habit of reaching decisions promptly and changing these decisions slowly if and when they were changed. People who fail to accumulate money without exception have the habit of reaching decisions, if at all, very slowly and of changing these decisions quickly and often. So that's, that's some of the thoughts and ideas on, on having that philosophy change, okay? You're going to have to find what that is. Now, my story, you guys have heard what my story is. I went to one event. Now, here's my, my story on going to the event and plugging into the system and being committed. I remember doing a, a hotel meeting. I'm a pro three, pro, I think it was a pro four at the time. So I'm really deep in the trenches of building my business. I was the guy. I will present. I'll do whatever it takes to help this business succeed. In fact, I remember recruiting people into network marketing. And they said to me, it doesn't work. I failed before in network marketing. And you know what I said to them? I will not let you fail. I will be by your side. Anytime you, you need some help, you call me. If you have a meeting, I'll do it. It does not matter. I will not let you fail. Is that a promise I can make? It's not. It's out of my control. But I made that commitment to people. And because I made that commitment, I expected and I carried that mantle of responsibility. Nobody fails in my business. So if there was somebody that was not pulling their weight or they're getting frustrated, they're getting down, they're not doing their exposures, I was going to go make it happen for them. And I found myself managing the, the entire infrastructure of my business with people who didn't want it. Like maybe that first dog that you saw that picture of. Probably not the right dog with the right behavior that's going to get the job done. I didn't find the Robbie when I had my first batch of people that I was enrolling. I had, I had behaviors of people that were not showing the same kind of commitment. They weren't showing the same type of sacrifices. Here's what happened. I would hold a weekly meeting every week at a local restaurant. And my team was going to be there. And I was going to present. And I got the whiteboard there. I got the ABC News clip. I'm ready to rock and roll. And one night, I remember I made a commitment to be away from the family to go do that meeting because I was committed and I was going to make sure nobody failed in my business. And I showed up to the restaurant early and I was all set up, ready to go. Whiteboard's there, ABC ready to go. And the waitress comes in and says, do we want to get you started on something to eat or drink before your team comes? Nope, I'm going to wait for my team because they're going to be here. Well, as the time came for start time, I was the only one in the room. And about 15 minutes later, as I start making phone calls and texting, no one's responding. By 30 minutes after the hour, it was kind of obvious to me that nobody was coming to the meeting. Now, I don't know, have you guys experienced that before? Making the commitment you're going to do it and no one else does it? Is that frustrating? It sucks. It flat clean sucks, right? I remember grabbing my whiteboard, ejecting the, the video uh, ABC News clip. I went and got in my car. I flipped the little DVD video on the floor of my car. I grabbed my phone and I called Marcel Niederhauser. And I said, Marcel, it's not working. Nobody's doing anything. I said, they're not plugging into anything. I started giving him all the things that wasn't working, why this wasn't going to work for me. And I told him, I know how to make money. I've owned my own businesses. I know how to make this thing work. And then Marcel started talking to me through that process. And then he said something to me that caught me off guard. He says, you've got an elite academy coming up. Are you going? Ha! Huh, going? I can't even get anybody to plug into a meeting here, let alone go to an elite academy. And Marcel made the comment to me, are you committed? And it 
ticked me off, to be honest with you. It ticked me off. What do you mean am I committed? I showed up at the meeting. I did all this stuff. I've done all these things for everybody else. Hell yes, I'm committed. That's how I felt. And Mar Marcel says, great, then we'll see you in Elite Academy. And then he said this. When you go to Elite Academy, come back and enroll five more people. And that ticked me off even more. Have you ever heard that when you're frustrated, go enroll five more people? So here's what happened. I went to the Lead Academy. I tried to get as many people as I could to go with me. I'm a pro four. And by the way, Elite Academy was about an eight hour drive to Anaheim, California. You think that would be something to be pulled off? You guys be okay with going only eight hours to get to an Elite Academy? By car, by the way, not by plane. Yeah, that'd be like, hey, if we get everybody there, if we could have that happen, I had four. I had four. Four people went with me to the Lead Academy. We went. We took my SUV. I was the guy that pioneered all of it. I'm just jumping in my car. Let's go. We went to Elite Academy. I loved it. The four people left a little bit early. They didn't go show up on time. The last day they left halfway through and went to the, uh, down to the beach in Anaheim. And on the drive back, they complained the whole way. How? Ah, how would you feel? Pretty burnt? Pretty frustrated? I was so focused, this is what I heard come out of their mouth. Blah, 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 blah. True story. I didn't hear a word that came out of their mouth. The only thing, like the dog in that picture, the only thing I could see was that bite suit. Something happened at that Elite Academy that changed me. Something happened at that Elite Academy that I have so vision and so focused, I did not care what was going on around me. Completely did not care. And I came back and I went to work. Something happened. I don't know if maybe my posture changed a little bit. I don't know if it was just the magical stars that lined up. I don't know what it was, but I enrolled five more people. Those five more people, six months later, went pro, uh, each one of them went pro fives. Created a volume for me to go pro seven. People ask, how did you go pro seven within 11 months? You know what I did? Found five more people. I stayed committed to what I said I was going to do. And that's an easy thing on a principal side to do it. It's a hard thing on that mechanic side because we start knitting, picking every little thing that we do when we get involved in the business. We think maybe it's the phone call I'm making. Maybe I'm not doing a good job. Maybe it's the opportunity meeting that I'm doing. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about this or I should be doing that. And we start second guessing everything that we do on how we're presenting the information and we're worried about mechanics. But the real principle that I learned from that was be committed and follow the system. I did my presentations the way I taught with the them. And I happened to find five people. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if it's the moon lining up or what. Maybe it'll work for you. I don't know. I can just tell you what works for me. That process worked every single time as I've had these points where I hit these lows and was getting frustrated in building my business. It changes through that process. Okay? So that was my experience on how to get out of the rut. If you want to get out of that rut, go out and find, sign up and find more people. <laughs> there's, that, there's that thing. But here's the cool thing. We have a rule called the principle of one. Show me one and I'll create a million. Show me one and I'll create a million. I learned a very powerful experience by going out and identifying one person that wanted it bad enough and then driving that volume through there. And we'll talk a little bit about business structure. Um, where was I going with that? When you start to find that must in you, you have to define your purpose. Now, I'm not talking about your why. I'm talking about your purpose. Your why is what's going to fuel you. You've heard it said that your, your why has got to get to the point where you cry. Here's what I say. Your why shouldn't make you cry. Your why should make, move you to act. I've seen a lot of people cry. And that's a start. But if it doesn't move you to act and get out of your comfort zone, it's not deep enough. Purpose. Purpose is everything. This is the, uh, the mission of the, of the company. Making people better and in so doing, making the world a better place. We are looking for purpose-inspired organizations. That's what the focus is here. Let's find people that are inspired. There's a book called Not What You Sell, It's What You Stand For by Roy Spence, one of the favorite, my favorite books. And it talks about what is your purpose. Okay? Here's the example of what Aristotle says. It defines your purpose. And maybe you can, this will help you on establishing that point, that must for you. Where your talents and the needs of the world cross, therein lies your purpose. What a simple definition to help you define your purpose. Where your talents and the needs of the world cross, therein lies your purpose. What talents do you have? Where's the time you spend most of your passions and interests? If you can take that and tie it in to what demands that are out there, you'll build a successful business. Here's what I learned. Here was Trent Lindstrom's takeaway. Trent Lindstrom's takeaway is it's not so much about the details of the company. It's not so much about the details of the product. 
It's not so much about whether we're in front of this in the timing aspect or, or how much money we can create. It all is funneled around you. It is all funneled around you. So when we think about the presentation, what's the most part, important part of the presentation? Your story. As crazy and as simple as that is, it's your story. We worry about knowing all the nuts and bolts of the company and all the dynamics of the company. You don't need to know that. You need to know what your story is. And you should be comfortable talking about your experiences and your story. And if you can get really good at that, your posture will start to change. Here's the other thing that will happen. As your posture changes, and I call it your believability antennas go up, you start to find other people that want to be a part of the same thing. You start to find other people that actually have the same kind of pains that you have, and they want something different. So when I think about what information we need to communicate, there's three key point, components in my mind for a presentation. Your story, the company's story, and how to make money. I'm going to throw one more out there. How you utilize this opportunity to get you where you want to be. Okay? So company story, your story, how to make money, and then where that takes people. Okay? So there's four pieces, where it takes them. Because a lot of times we can talk all day long about the components of the opportunity. And it's an awesome thing to talk about the opportunity. But if we cannot connect what that means for somebody and where that can get them to, they don't connect to your message. Does that make sense? You've connected to the message because you've been able to paint a picture on this opportunity is going to get me to here. And you've connected on that. But this business is not about you. It's about other people. It's about the person you're sitting in front of and talking to. If you cannot find out how this opportunity is going to help that individual get to here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter all the science. It doesn't matter all the detail. All the stuff that doesn't matter. It does not make sense. So if your passion, where your believability antennas are high, is the peer-reviewed studies, stay there. Stay there. You need to stay there because that's part of your story. If your passion is about creating leveraged income, you need to be talking about that. If your passion is something else, I don't care what it is, that's the arena you need to be playing ball in. Because as soon as you step out of that and try to act like somebody you're not, it won't work. Because if we're going to be real connectors in this business, we got to be real on what we are part of. Does that make sense? Do we agree on that? Okay. All right, so that's, what my, that's my, uh, my opinion on, on presentations. One last thing that I'm going to cover, and then I, I want to um, uh, switch gears a little bit. Sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to erase that or not. Did you guys get that information? Well, if not, we'll write it back over there. It's this theory behind uh, farming versus hunting. You guys ever heard of this before? What happens in network marketing, and it's natural and it's normal, you got involved in this because you want something different. So when we get started, we're out building the business, we just want as many people to join us. Because we understand that's how we create leverage, and we make it about us. So we're just going out through our database, we're going out to our network of people that we've got, and we're hammering them. And it's natural and common that as soon as we get started in the business, we prejudge who will and who won't. One of the first mistakes most people make, me included. We prejudge who will and who won't. So they get involved. So we get involved in the business. We go to the four or five people that we know. If they sign up, we're going to be rock stars. They'll be rock stars. That'll make me rock star. This is a win. We're good. <laughs> and we prejudge who will and who won't, right? And then we let that expectation either make us excited or put us into to depression. And I don't know why it is part of the laws of the universe, but in network marketing, who you think will, won't, and who you don't think is going to join, ends up joining. Am I right or am I wrong? That's, I don't know why it is that way. It just is. So we have to break those, those, those mindsets. But what happens is when we fall in that mode, we start operating here in this department, hunting. We go out there and we just start shooting everything we possibly can. We got a friend. Boom, I want them to sign up in the business. <laughs> Somebody says, hey, how are you doing? I do good. Boom, I want you to be involved in the business. Okay, you follow me? And we start just hammering people. You got to join my opportunity. You got to join my opportunity. And then as soon as you put the invitation out, then you got to put them in the room with whoever's going to present him. Whoever, whoever that person is, you want to get them in, the front, in front of that room. And we're just going out there acting like a hunter, going after our prey. And what happens to our prospects? They act like prey. They literally run. Okay, and we make that, that comment about NFL, no friends left list. You don't want to be in the NFL category, no friends left. If you're in that category, here you are. You're hunting. I've had one person in four years of experience 
that clearly was here to where she literally had no friends left. Literally had no friends left. And you know what I told her? She wants it bad, by the way. She's hungry. She wants it. She wants this to work. You know what I told her? We're going to work on being a good connector. You are not to say another word about life manager, or ProTanum or anything else. Just completely take it out of your vocabulary. I'm going to teach you how to connect to somebody without even putting an invite out. Okay, does that, does that make sense? They say the three foot roll, if there's anybody in front of the three foot, okay. That's, that's to help you kind of get start working on invites, but let me tell you something. We have to develop skills, so we're gonna make ourselves better. You don't wanna be in this category. Here's the, how you know if you're a hunter. Well, number one, people don't respond to you. But number two, all you're doing is no activity in your business. And by the way, this, this, this topic idea right here is called volume producing activity. Volume producing activity. We just talked about mindset a second ago. We're done with that. Okay? We, we agree we got to make the philosophy change and make our brain right. But once we work on our philosophy change and we get that right, if you're not doing volume producing activity, you will not grow a business. So this is the volume producing activity. I love you if you show up to the meeting to support a meeting. I love you if you put an invite out. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you find yourself, there's a meeting on Wednesday, April the 1st, right? This is what we put on the board. If you wait till the, uh, it would be March 31st, March 30th, to maybe put out an invite, or you wait till April the 1st to put out an invite, you're hunting. You're hunting. All you're trying to do is gather the flock Get that prey all gathered together and try to shoo them into a room so they can all be shot at once. That's what we're looking for, right? That's the honey program. Now, farming is far different. Farming is you're turning the soil. You're preparing the ground. You're putting the seed out. You're nurturing the seed. You're watering it. You're pulling the weeds. You're developing the relationship. You're making the contact. You follow me? Far different. The good news is, is if you do it the right way like a professional, Chances are you will make more friends, not lose more friends. That's a powerful experience when that's done correctly. This is a connecting business. I can promise you people want to talk about themselves. They want to talk about their pains and their sorrows and their aches. And they also want to have hope. They want to have hope. They want something better. And if you will go through the farming process of allowing people what I call self-discovery, that does not mean you don't do your follow-up. That does not mean you don't give people commitments. We have to make sure we're doing our follow-ups. We still have to make sure we're doing our commitments to people, right? Give them that invitation to, to join your business. You still have to posture up. But what I'm suggesting here is building those connections. If you're not always working on building your database, you're going to find your business is shrinking. You will find your business is shrinking. All right, so farming is planting the seeds. Here's what I mean by that. Statistically, if we go to the follow-up, how many touches does somebody need to have odds in your favor? Five. What's the, what's the odd, by the way, at five? Do you remember, guys remember what that is? What's the percentage? Say again? 80%. Okay, what is it on the first exposure? You guys know what that number is? Two. Now, I'm just going to go on strict statistics, okay? What I know about statistics is that a ratio starts to appear when, there, when there's consistency to it. So when we're exposing this information and, and, and recruiting people, if that is a number that we're seeing a lot of consistency to, why in the hell, pardon the French, now they're not going to record any of this, why in the hell would we go out there and hammer people to come into a meeting to get hammered to actually sign up? See, a lot of amateurs, in my opinion, Trent's opinion, a lot of amateurs will say, go gather as many people as you can, put them into a room, we're going to have the out-of-town guru show up, and they're going to sign people up. That's not how the business works. That's an easier, it seems like an easier approach. Put 20 people in a room, let's get all 20 of them to sign up, and then we're done. Okay? That does not work for statistics. Statistics is 2%. So if you guys want to work your business on a 2% odd, go out there and hammer all your family and friends and tell them to come to a group meeting. Now, if you want to literally do the, uh, the, the volume-producing activity, here's what I'm going to suggest. You're going to connect to somebody. You're going to give them an invite. Now, how do I know what kind of an invite you're going to give them? Because you found out what their pain is. They either have a pain of time, they have a pain of money, or they have a pain of health. You find out what it is. The good news is that we have a solution to one of those three, if not all three, yeah? Okay, so we're going to make a connection to them. When I find out somebody has that pain, I'm going to give them a very basic invite. They've already asked for it because they're the one that said it. Okay? Now, let me give you an example. Talking to a waiter, uh, waiter the other day. 
we're just having a good conversation. I asked him uh, about you know the job that he's doing, how much he likes it. He told me, yeah, I'm doing this part time. Oh, really? Why are you doing it part time? So he tells me some of the pains he got. Guess what he's got a pain of? Time and money. And I asked him this question at the very end of our conversation. I said, let me just ask you something. I'm working with a, with a company that's helping people in different areas, and I just want to ask you a couple questions. No, 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 uh, no strings attached to this, but there seems to be three common concerns for most everybody, time of money, or pain of money, pain of health, and pain of uh, uh, time, time, money, and health. I said, which one would you adjust first and why if you could? And he told me it would be money. I, I need money, and he told me why. And I said, what would you adjust second? And he says, time. I need more time. So it was money, and then it was time. And I said, what about your health? I don't really care about my health. Okay, now, why is that important? What kind of an invite am I going to give him? Some tied to time of money, right? Why would I give him something tied to health? So what happens a lot is because we think that people are not interested in business, or we think people are not interested in network marketing, or we think that we know what's wrong with people, that we're going to give them the invite we think they should get. We're guessing at this point. And if I would have went to that waiter and I said to that waiter, hey, man, I'm part of a business really awesome and we got a really cool product. Yeah, take a look at this product. And blah, 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 blah. I tell him all the reasons why he needs to look at the product. Is that going to be of interest to him? No, because it was for me, not for him. Does that make sense? Once we connect to somebody, our first job is to give them a basic invite to get us some information. So our first one's going to be an invite. Let's get some information out there. And that invite's going to be very natural. Okay, that's the simplest basic way for me to teach you how to do an invite. And it's principle-focused invite, not just an invite that's going to get everyone to say yes. So if we can develop skills and start working on a way that we do our invite, man, it's powerful. It's powerful because then you make that connection, you find out what they need. One last one I'll share with you, and then we're going to go through this farming part. I'm on an airplane, and I wanted to go to my first premier school, and I want to teach something really, really cool to that group. My first premier school that I was going to go to, I was going to give them a conversion story. Here's what my conversion story was. I met a lady on an airplane. We had a one-hour flight. She was sitting next to me. And in my mind, I thought, I am going to recruit this person to my business. And I'm going to take that story with me to that premier school. So she sits down in the chair. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, she has no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> I'm thinking about the whole uh, um, Lion King pouncing lessons. She was about to get a pouncing lesson. I was going to pounce all over her, right? She sits down. And then all of a sudden, something came to my mind. And it was this... Um, seven habits of highly effective people. The one of those habits was listening. You got to seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. Hey, why not? It's a good principle. Let's work on it. Let's try it. So I tried it. And I asked her a question and her response was short. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like a, it was something about, you know, how are you? Where are you from? And it was short responses. And I asked another follow-up question and another follow-up question. Within a few minutes before the plane took off, her body posture in the chair literally turned to me and she's telling me her life story. I'm learning. I'm seeking to understand her certain situation. Here's what I learned about this individual. By the way, still good friends with her. Um, this is what I learned about her. 34 years with IBM. She happened to get out right before IBM, changed the way they did business, and off-resourced uh, a lot of the way that they do business. And unfortunately for a lot of her coworkers, she got out in time to get a retirement, and all of her coworkers didn't. That's what I learned about her. I learned that she was going from Georgia to uh, Orlando, Florida, to see family. Okay. 45 minutes to an hour into my flight, the plane's about to touch ground. And she says, what do you do? Now, what a powerful experience it was for me to ask those questions to get to know this individual and not even say one thing about my business endeavor until 45 minutes to an hour later when the plane was to touch ground. Now, I'm thinking about the pains that were going on that she was describing to me. And my invite was so natural and so powerful. It was so awesome. I said to her, well, you know how you were talking about all your coworkers because that's where her pain was? She felt so bad for her coworkers that lost their jobs and their life struggling. I said, you know those coworkers you were talking about? She says, yeah. I said, it's ironic because I teach people how to get away from the insecurities in the workforce to create security as an entrepreneur. She says, really? That's what you do? I got to introduce you to my friends. I said, well, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> she's, by the way, she's not even part of the business. She's not even part of the business. She didn't need it. Okay? She chose not to take the product, but we've got a friendship. So the point that I'm making is if you will put some of these principles to work first, it's very powerful what happens. All right, invite. Very basic invite is going to go out there. Touch number one. You've already connected to them. They got an invite. 
Touch number two. By the way, what's the purpose? I said everything has to be purpose focused. What's the purpose of the invite? To inquire and listen, right? So we're, but we're going to do that first before we get the invite out, right? We're going to identify what the pain is, and then we're going to get an invite to do what? Get some information. That's correct. You're exactly right. That's the preface to the invite. We're going to do those things that you talked about. And then after that, we're going to invite them to get some information. Who's the message? Is it you? You're, you're right. It's not you. It's somebody else, right? So what if we actually made it a rule, especially getting started in our business? If there's anybody in here that's new, the rule is you're not going to be the one vomiting information on them. Why don't we lead them to somebody else? So why don't we make touch number two, exposing them to some information. And that information, I don't care if it's a one-on-one. -on -one, that's what we call it. I don't care if it's a video. I don't care if it's a webinar. It does not matter to me. But you connect them to some information. Let's just say in this example, we're going to put them to a, a, the ABC uh, video, I don't, whatever, ABC primetime, okay? They get the ABC primetime. All right, touch number three. They got the ABC primetime. Then what do we do? I like it. We're already on the right track here. We're going to put him in front of somebody. Why? Okay. Third-party validation stands to validate. That's all it does. Now, what are we validating? Here's my opinion. If you're going to do a third-party phone call, very short, very sweet, two to five minutes, you're done. Two to five minutes, you're going to say, this is so-and-so, and they're going to share their why, and I'm going to introduce you to my friend so-and-so, and they're going to share why. It's why to why. Why is that important? Because didn't we say we're connectors? How cool would it be? If I actually connected somebody to Daisy and Daisy told her story, then I'm so glad you're taking a look at this information. What did you think about what you saw so far? Oh, it was this, it was that, it was all these wonderful, great things, whatever you're validating, right? And Daisy says, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I like some of those things as well. Let me tell you what this has done for me. This has totally impacted my life in these areas like this, da, 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 da. And there, that was that connection that's being created, right? Now we're on what touch? Touch number three, right? Okay, so now we validate. One other thing that Daisy's going to do is give them an invite to get some more information. We're gonna give them another invite. Where are we inviting them to? Now we're leading people through the process. We're not forcing them. We're leading them through the process. Here's the fourth thing we're gonna do. We're gonna invite them to a, I hope you guys can read this writing by the way, I'm writing this fast, group meeting. Now where did the group meeting come into the play? At the very beginning? Or have we already planted the soil, or play, uh, turned the soil, planted the seed, and started fertilizing the seed? What were we doing? We're planting, right? We're farming right here. We're actually leading people to a group meeting. Now, where's our odds, by the way? If we're four touches in, where's our odds? 87, yeah, we're almost to 80%. Where well, I think we're just shy of 80% on four touches. Now, are we in a better position to give somebody a commitment to join us? It's a lot easier. Man, we've already gave them an invite. We connected with them. We found their pain. We played an ABC News clip or some information. We did a third-party validation call. And we actually invited them to a group meeting. Or you can invite them to a one-on-one. -on -one. That's up to you. I don't care what the circumstances are. It could be a one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe, maybe Daisy says, hey, I got some uh, time available on Wednesday. Why don't we get together and talk a little bit more about this? Great, let's do it. So now we do a one-on-one. -on -one. Then we invite them to a group meeting. Does that make sense? All we're simply doing is putting odds in your favor. That's, 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 uh, that is uh, volume-producing activities. You're progressing people through the touches, and you have to be engaged in this process. Is it possible that you can introduce somebody to a video, do a three-way phone call, but they don't want to go here? To number, step number four. Yes, that is possible. And if that happens, what does that tell you about the person? Not the right one. Not the right one. That's the power of this. You don't have to worry about it. The process is going to eliminate the ones that are not real, and it's going to attract the ones who want to make a change. Now, do you want to work with business with people who are not real, or do you want to work with business with people who want it bad enough? We want the ones that want it bad enough because we know we can do this together. So this is a process that we're going to go through to make that happen. What's the rule? What's the rule behind it on follow-up? 24 to 48 hours. So it should happen within a day to two days. Now, I've heard Seth Mulder make this comment a lot, and I love it. We build our business today and tomorrow, period. If we push it out a week, we've lost that emotion. Okay? We work the business today and tomorrow. Here's what I would say, though. What I would say when we talk about the timeline on this process, if we know Wednesday, April the 1st, we're going to have a meeting, we need to start building people through this process to get them to the fourth or fifth touch by the time that meeting hits. The problem is we go from one to five in one day. And we expect everybody to know what we know. And that's the reason why sometimes the presenter is tasked with this idea of communicating all this information because the person coming into it has none. Let's make it easy for everybody. How do we make it easy for everybody? We're not here to talk about just facts. Facts tell emotion sells, right? We know that. Why don't we connect on emotion to help? To, to not, <laughs> my wife's laughing over there. To heck with the facts. 
We've got to get some facts out there to bring credibility to the information, but that facts can be communicated in step one, step two, step three, step four. Does that make sense? So to answer your question, it should be today and tomorrow, but if we're going to start to make phone calls and it's today's Saturday and we know we've got a meeting next Wednesday, man, today would be a good day to start making phone calls because I already know in my mind that by next Wednesday, I want touch number four. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to switch a little bit gears here. How many are, are new, like within the last, let's say, three months or newer or six months or newer? And raise your hands. In that, six months or newer. How about three months or newer? Two months or newer? One month? Are you guys all one-monthers? Okay, we're all... Well, no, I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just... Okay, here's what I want to do really fast. We're going to do this in 10 minutes. And the good thing about doing this in 10 minutes is this is literally how I do it in real life. And that is how do you get somebody started correctly? I personally feel it's the most important part of getting the business going. Okay, I, I relate it to like the motorcycle world. In the motorcycle world, when they start a race, they have the gate set up. you got all these bikes lined up. And they always say, every time you interview, these guys are interviewed on TV, they always say, you got to get out of the gate ahead of everybody else. That's important. you got to run your own race. And if you get stuck in that pack, you can't run your own race. Well, this business is no different. you got to get out of the gate fast. If you wait, people are going to start to lose that emotion, that experience. you got to get them some results. And I'm not saying results of just signing people up. It's the results of the volume-producing activity. The hope is they've already made the commitment, all right? So have you, be, have you got the blueprint? You got a blueprint in front of you, anybody? Okay, you got, I see a couple of blueprints that are there. All right, this is actually a great, a great thing to kind of follow through, but here's the deal. This is Trent's philosophy. There are going to be some people that they look at this and start looking at check marks. They're going to go, yeah, no, no, I ain't going to go there. And this is what I did. <laughs> Hold on a minute. What? I got to fill out some paper. <laughs> what? Fill out some paperwork? That's not how I'm wired. I don't want to fill out any paperwork. Okay, so how I got started in this business is I didn't use this. However, it's been a great tool for me to get my business going. There are going to be some people who just want to go and run. Go and run with them and don't say, hold on a minute. We got to go, we got to go through the book. Okay, I had some experiences of some distributors that will spend two hours on this thing. It is not volume producing activity. It does not grow your business. It's a start, but you're going to slow play. It's like, it's like, um, Walking somebody through coming out of the motorcycle gate. Push your bike so you can kind of feel what it likes in the dirt. No, we get on it and we ride. Does that make sense? Now, that's not the rule for everybody. This is just a, just a general rule. So when there are somebody that just doesn't need this, they just need to go out and talk to people. Marcel's advice on getting somebody started, I love this. He says, how fast do you want your money back? That's a great question to ask. How fast do you want your money back? If somebody says, I want it back today, great. Statistically, I can tell you what you got to do. We got to go talk to 15 people a day. Let's go. And I'm good for it. If you want to run, let's go run. Let's go talk to 15 people. I'd rather do one-on-ones with them. Make a phone call. Get me in front of them. Let's go talk. You will start seeing activity come out of that versus saying, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we start that next week? This week, we're going to start working on your why. <laughs> and my goal is to help make you cry. If I don't get you crying, we're going to spend some more time on your why. Okay? I, there's some people that don't need that. They just need to go to work. You, you, I, don't I get my point across? Okay, all right, cool. So here's what I do in literally 10 minutes. If I get somebody who just wants to go to work, we're just going to go to work, and we're we'll work through it, right? On-the-job training, they'll get the experience through that process. The ones who want to go through it, and by the way, this last week I had somebody want to go through it. We literally went through it about this fast. Watch how this works. I start on on-the-job training, and I actually mark this up like the scriptures, right? I got this thing marked up on here. And on-the-job training is transferring belief from one who knows to one who wants to know. If somebody's hungry enough, let's transfer that belief. I hit on paragraph number two, and I actually have them read it, and I underline some points in paragraph number two. If you have paragraph number two, I'll read it real quick. As an enroller, your role is to become a mentor to the business builders in your downline. As you enroll and place distributors, I'll underline this word, sift, and I underline this word, identify, business builders, and I underline that word. Business builders are distributors that take action, I underline that word, by attending meetings, I underline that word, trainings, I underline that word, and inviting prospects, I underline that word. Identifying business builders isn't about listening to what a person says, I underline that. It's about watching what they do, I underline that. Does that sound good? Here's the deal. Some people are going to sign up and they will not build a business. And you can pound them like a dead horse. Nothing's going to happen. In fact, if anything, you're going to tick them off. Right? 
But if you start to look at their behaviors, i.e. like Robbie, you're going to see something different in them. Your job is to find those business builders. And if you go out and enroll five, will all five of them be a business builder? No, it might take 10 or 15. I don't know what that number is. It could take you 20 or 25. I don't know. But here's what I can tell you. When you find five people who want to run like you want to run, it's magic, baby. It's magic. It is really cool to go through that experience. Okay? So we're going to find five people who are going to do this by uh, identifying business builders. As we find business builders, 100% will be you or what I say to the person, 100% will be me. I am your mentor and your, 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 your team support. I will help expose the information you put them in front of me. Okay? As we start to expose the information, we're going to identify people that will join the business and very quickly, very quickly, we shift to a 50-50 role. Okay? So it would look something similar to this. Well, when I'm talking, I'm just going to talk because we're going to go through this fast anyway. Here's what it will be. As we start exposing the information, you're going to say, I'm excited because, fill in the blanks, give it to me, I take over the, the presentation. When we do a next second or third presentation, you're going to say, I'm excited because, and this is an ABC News investigation. Whatever's going to start the presentation and then turn it over to me. When we get to the fifth or sixth presentation or tenth presentation and we're starting to re uh, get somebody in, uh, recruiting into the business, you're going to say, I'm excited because this is the first part of the presentation and you're going to start doing maybe science or some things that you're most passionate about. Okay? Can you see what's happening? on the job training. We're immediately transferring that area of responsibility. So even though they're engaging in their own database, they're actually participating in the presentation. How cool is that? And then you as the mentor are going to help play clean up or mop up and engage through that, okay? So that'll be the role. Now as we start to recruit, guess who starts to sift out of the or shift out of the 50-50 role? That new person. That's correct. The new person now has some new people. That new person's going to become that advisor very quickly. If they're not ready for it, don't push them here. You'll slow your business down. You work with your personal enrollment while they help their new enrollment go find their people. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what I explained right out of the gate. Does that sound good to you? And they're going to say yes. If they don't say that's good for them, we're going to kind of address some concerns there. That's okay, not a big deal. I have not had anybody say I'm not comfortable with that. We go until they're comfortable. All right, now, real quickly, we're going to go out there and create our, our database and our why. Here's what I do. To start out on our, our why, I ask them to talk about and write something down very quickly, one or two sentences. One or two sentences what they want out of the business, one or two sentences on why they want to do the business. And they write that down very quickly in about 30 seconds. That's all I spend with them. And I'm going to tell them, you're going to work on that and drive it deeper. But let's start here. Now we're going to go to the database. Here's what I do. In three minutes, I do a three-minute drill. Okay? We're not going to do this for the sake of time, but I want you to think three minutes. We're going to do a three-minute drill memory jogger. You're not to use your phone. We're going to write down everybody you know in three minutes. And I will write the names down. You just tell me them. And so you're going to write them down. Boom, 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 boom. The average is 15 to 30 names. Okay? About 15 to 30 names is what people could come up with right out of the gate. Now, we're only into this thing about maybe 10 minutes at this point. Our goal is to have this wrapped up within 15 minutes and start making phone calls. 20 minutes max. Okay? Three minutes, got the database going. We've got about 15 to 30 names. Now, statistically, if we have 30 names written down on a sheet, statistically, what is that going to yield us? Any, any idea? About three to six-ish, somewhere right around there. Now, that doesn't mean that we go through 30 people and we're going to guarantee a six. You might go through 30, 30 people and get zero. But if we consistently do the behaviors of doing our presentations, you will find that ratio start to appear statistically. People just stop. They don't keep it consistent. All right? So 30 names, we know we have about three to six people that are ready to join on that list statistically. Right? We're going to identify five people that you're comfortable the most to talk to. So they're going to look at their list and they're going to asterisk, star, five people you're comfortable talking to. They asterisk the five people. You're immediately going to shift to the invite. And we're going to break down some basic invites. Now, who do you think are on their list of the five people they, they, they uh, are most comfortable talking to? Family and, Family and best friends. It's the warmest market. Okay, warmest market, I have found, are not the ones that actually build this huge, huge business, but I call it a proving ground. It's a proving ground. That's all it is. We're going to get some initial information out. So your five people that are on there, we just want to get in front of them so they can start to hear the presentation. It's our on-the-job experience. They talk to five people, and all our invite is, as basic as it is, 
I've been introduced to something absolutely incredible that I'm excited about. May or may not be for you. If I could put you in front of some information, would you take a look at it? Very basic. And we go talk to him immediately right out of the gate. Five that day, we'll go see. If we can do five that day, we'll go see him. Okay? That immediately starts getting information going. That's day number one within 15 to 20 minutes. That's how fast we work. Okay? Now, we've done that in 15 minutes or so. We worked on the invite. Guess what we do for the next 45 minutes if, we're, if we have a one-hour meeting? Make a phone call. That's exactly right. We're making phone calls, setting up appointments. That's all we're doing. That's day number one. What's day number two? Exact same thing. We're literally making more phone calls and we're seeing the meetings. What's day number three? Follow-ups to the meetings that we first did, making more phone calls, setting up more meetings. Do you follow what we're doing? It's volume producing activity. That's what we do that fast. Any questions? I promise you, if you will work that kind of speed, you will start to see an urgency out of new people when they get involved. Here's the deal. When you're first new, you got to get your head wrapped around this idea. And that's a scary thing. So it's a natural, normal feeling to say, how about we make phone calls tomorrow? Or wait till I can go to a meeting. Or I need to learn more. I need to learn more about the comp plan. I need to know more about the science. And we purposely drag our feet. Okay? We don't want to drag feet. We want to immediately produce uh, volume and income. That's what I say on getting started. Any questions on that? Try it your next time. You'll have a lot of fun doing it. You're going to find people will get out of their comfort zone. I've seen people literally with beads of sweat coming down their head. And it's been fun. It's been fun to be a part of that with them. And, <laughs> no, I don't mean it in a bad, like, weird, funky way. But what I mean by that, what I mean by that is I've literally made phone calls too. And that's really funky. I've had beads of sweat rolling down my head. I pulled out my phone and went like this on my contact list and watched the, the names go through. And whenever it lands, I make a phone call. I wouldn't recommend that. That's a risky proposition. I had somebody totally deny me on the phone. It was really cool. And then the, the, the person that I was doing it was like, I ain't making any calls. So is that going to happen? Yeah. It does happen. You'll get rejected. And when it does, what's the next thing you do? Make another phone call right out of the gate. This, my son drops the motorcycle. You pick it right back up and keep riding. That's what we do in this business, okay? Thanks for letting me be a part of it. You